Hello and welcome to another episode of Pro Tip Conversations. Uh, today we're excited to welcome Kenneth Daniel uh, to the show. Um, Kenneth is an award-winning basketball coach who has served the Scarborough, Ontario area for over 25 years. He has been recognized on many occasions for championing the cause of making uh, places and programs available for youth to learn and participate in positive activities. For his dig- diligent community service, Ken was the recipient of the prestigious Marcus Garvey Memorial Award. K- Ken remains a role model within his community, focusing on making on his Making Hoops Kitty Ball program, uh, Children's Aid of Toronto Community Advisory Committee, and as a co-chair of the Young Street Mission Men's Group, advocating for the annual university fair to provide youth with exposure to higher education. You can view his full bio and list of accomplishments in the episode notes. Um, today, we'll chat with Ken about his journey into coaching and gain insights uh, on his coaching philosophy. So without further ado, welcome, uh, Ken. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm excited and uh, let's get started. Awesome. So uh, right off the bat, uh, what got you started in basketball? Um, you know, playing with my friends. Uh, I'm from the islands. I've been in Canada over 50 years. Um, like you, cricket was the sport in the islands. I didn't know anything about basketball, but uh, growing up as a young person, I was a hockey player. I used to play hockey. Okay. But um, cultural differences, actually, and when you look at basketball, I saw a lot of people that looked like me. Mm. So I gravitated to a sport. Um, it was warmer. It was inside. Mm-hmm. But then there was lots of people like me who was playing, and that's how I got uh, started with basketball. So, so you mentioned hockey. Uh, did you play any other sports as well um, growing up? Well, I played hockey. I played football. I played baseball. And, and life is funny. I, in grade six, okay. um, I went to a public school, and um, I was uh, two years into this country. And my gym teacher saw me hit a baseball, and he said, I've never seen a kid hit a baseball so far. What? Right out there, he took me to the baseball team. The problem with, I've never seen how a baseball moved. So it was underhanded, but the ball was going left, right, up and down. I struck out three times in a row. He cut me off the team. Oh, no. <laughs> so once, you know, one game I went to, and they didn't teach me the context of the game. And so it had a lifelong effect on me. Um, I was in my 40s. I did a um, healthy childhood development course. And they were talking about look back in your childhood and see anything that had effect on you playing other sports. Mm. And at, in my 50s, I realized I never want to play baseball again because it was such a horrible experience. So um, one and, negative experience kind of changed yeah, the trajectory. Yeah. But it has such a big impact when you're young. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about coaches and, and different things. We're going to talk about these things. Um, people don't realize the impact it has on, you, on the youth. A coach makes a child or they break a child. Mm. Yeah. And so in later back, I realized why I never played the sport. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like they really didn't give you – that coach didn't give you an opportunity to be successful. So it's – Well, the, you know, when I teach kids, the biggest um, roadblock for young kids, they don't know how to fail. Right. Yeah. And sports gives you every opportunity in the world to fail and always have another opportunity. And that's part of my t- well, how I teach. So, any, you know. Yeah. And and so, I guess, so baseball, because of that experience, was uh, something you steered away from. And then you found yeah. basketball through playing with friends. And, you know, how, how, how has it, obviously, you know, you're coaching. So, we know part of the answer to this question. But growing up, how did basketball impact, uh, you know, your childhood? Well, I was four foot eleven in grade nine. I was one of the smallest kids. Um, I couldn't touch the net. Um, but in grade ten, I grew eight inches in the summer. Right. And I had muscles. And I used to. I was in the chess team. Um, I took classical music um, early on. And in grade ten, my whole life changed because all of a sudden, the girls like you. I had muscles when I went back to schooling, and everybody treated me different. Right. It changed my trajectory. Um, I, I became an athlete um, um, because I, my body changed. You know, you hear guys going five, six, seven inches. I was a very athletic, you know, I'm 5'10 right now. I could put my elbow in a 10-foot basket. 
I could jump out of the gym. And so, but I didn't learn the sport till later when I went to college. And so, you know, because I was a small athlete, I was a guard. I always work on fundamentals and I learned over the years, I got better in this competition, but grade 10 changed my whole trajectory on sports, how I saw myself as a, as a person, but also changed because I became an athlete. And it's, it has a big impact. And so did you play then at the university level? Um... Well, I played high school, Okay. a very good high school player. I played in North York and life is funny. I, I went to Downs your high school. We won the city championship, so I moved to Scarborough 716. My shirt said North York champions, NY champions. I go to Churchill in Scarborough, all the key people are talking, this guy from New York. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this guy from New York is playing in the school. Um, very, you know, I could stand on the basket, no step, I could dunk the ball two hands. Wow. At 5'10. No I could just jump straight up. Very good. I ended up playing in George Brown College. Uh, I had a lot of friends and basketball has been great, but I had, you know, George Brown is a Mecca of basketball in Canada. I played in the best men's league ever in this country. We all the Olympians with the Olympic team. Um, we had guys who played pro would come and run the best runs. It was in the summer at George Brown, but I learned when the, the coach said to me, um, you have to, you're a great athlete. Now I want you to become a basketball player. Hmm. And so even at the high NBA level, you see great athletes. There's only a handful, like LeBron James is a great basketball player who happens to be a great athlete. Mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird is not a great athlete, but he's a great basketball player. Mm -hmm. And so there is a difference. Um, we don't teach great athletes. We make them better athletes. Mm. But we can teach other people to be better basketball players. That's not you can't compete, right? So what makes you... Great app. It's all the things sometimes people, you know, as I said, learning that just don't be a, a great body, but also put the mind to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned when I'm college. And that has propelled me to be a, a better coach because now I understand a little better. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> and kind of to that, you've been involved in founding and helping establish a lot of different organizations like the Hurricanes Basketball Association, yeah. Making Hoops. Um, so you could tell us a bit about some of the programs you've been involved with and sort of what drives you to participate. Well, Mike Cummings and, um, you know, we were just talking about Mike uh, kind of when I moved to Scarborough. Uh, when my son was born, I moved, we moved to a house here. You see, Ken, the, he, Mike was running the Hurricanes basketball with Rudy Booker, uh, Brooker. And so they had, I don't know if you know who the Tatum kids are. Uh, the two Tatum girls, they played in Olympics for Canada. Both of them went to U UMass. Patrick Tatum went to Cleveland State. He's the head coach at McMaster University. Those were the building blocks of the Hurricane basketball. And so if it was not for Mike, you know, you always got to give these guys their props. And I was a very good basketball player. Um, the process of doing the Hurricanes, I also taught uh, coach at the, they had the thing called the Scarborough Peace Games. For over 20 or 30 years, they had Scarborough would go to Indianapolis one year, Indianapolis would come to Scarborough next year, and it was a blip program. But it was that like the mini Olympics and you'd have the mayor from Scarborough go to Indianapolis and so forth. And we take 29 over 30 Greyhound buses and had a mini uh, Olympics in Indianapolis. And the next year they come. So great experience. Um, meeting great people on both sides was a great exchange. And kids um, learned that we're not so similar um, because when they came to your house from a different financial, emotional all the different backgrounds and they came to somebody's house. We had kids that liked the food and they realized, holy smokes, the kids are not that different. You know, sports is the, it's the, it gets rid of all the isms. It puts it under the rug, it hides it. And for somebody from a poor place to go meet a king and a queen because they're athletic. You know, you look at Bolt and all these athletes who get to, you know, Formula One racing uh, and, horse race, all the different things. Sports opens every social door that education can't. Right, and yeah. so it's a it's the the teamwork that you learn, the relationships um, that you have with people is lifelong because of sports. So I've kind of gravitated to um, not just playing the sport with the young people, but also teaching them. 
I don't know if you see what's going on with Jeb, Mar Jeb Morant right now. Yeah. You take a million dollars and you give it to a poor person, they're a poor person with a million dollars. If you don't teach them how to handle the money, they throw it away because they don't understand the value. Mm -hmm. So I think as a coach, um, one of the things I took very seriously because I realized the importance it had for my life, I want to also teach the young people, it's just not running up and down. Why do we have five, six, seven coaches? Because it's not all about running up and down. There's a mental aspect of it. Coaching, training, teaching, um, planning, um, process. Um, the biggest thing I, I would say to, to you guys is um, sports teaches you process. You know, your math teacher said, I don't care how you got the answer. I don't care if it's right or wrong. Show me how you did it. Mm -hmm. Then we could figure it out. If it's wrong, now we could backtrack it. And process will teach you. That's what sports teaches you. It now takes you to every other aspect of your life because now you have, it teaches you how to time management. It teaches you right. how to work with a group of people that you put together, not because you like them, because the coach picked them, right? It forces you to get along with people. And so through basketball, I've been able to teach kids. I've been able to mentor kids. I've been able to have relationship with families and help them help their kids, you know, get a better education, play sport that they like, but also become better human beings. It, it sounds like you were speaking to a lot of the ways that sports is very much like uh, creates community and connects yes. people who may not be in the same groups. Yeah. So like, and a lot of your work seems to come back to community involvement and mentorship. And you received the Marcus Garvey Award for that. I was wondering if you could talk about the overlap you see between kind of coaching and mentorship and being sort of the community leader. Well, I think they all work together. One of the, um, you have community centers. Um, they have sport, they have activities where kids, um, one of the biggest problems we have right now, um, I, I went back to Kitty Ball. When I coached the Hurricanes, I had, we had 19 teams. We travel all over the U.S. But there's no, there's no time to teach kids. And so when you had an after-school program, we were teaching kids after basketball. They could do homework. Um, other things to, like, make the life better, not just this one dimensional um, sport where you focus. What happens when your lifespan in sport is sometimes two, three years, the average person sports is five years. When you see LeBron 20 years, that's a misnomer. It, it's it's yeah. odd, but then he's an oddity. Charles Barkley, when you see guys don't last one or two years, they get hurt. Um, the guy, Brandon, um, I can't remember the name. He played for Portland. Uh, Great Brandon, guy. Brandon Roy. A phenomenal athlete Amazing. needs, yeah. right? He didn't get a chance to, uh, Bobby Orr, you know, didn't get a chance to fulfill their potential. So what happens when you get hurt? So we just have to make sure we get a well-rounded athlete. I think for myself, it's always been, um, you know, I'm part of the community where I live. I want to do everything to make my, you know, I have to, I say to kids, don't, you can't drink all the water, suck all the air and eat all the food and don't give them anything back. Because yeah. then you're not being part of the community. It's all right. we, it's called, you know, we re recycle to a degree. You know, we take what we put back in. And so um, I've been able to not just be a basketball coach, but I, I take kids to the university fair. Uh, I'm one of a few people, um, I take kids to the university fair in grade eight um, because kids need to prepare for high school to so prepare for university. A yeah. lot of university comes to you when you're in grade 11. You took wrong courses in grade nine right when you take university you go to school now the university wants okay what do i need to get into i want to be a doctor this is what you need in grade nine grade ten but i find especially boys um they sometimes slower in getting it right and so sometimes the delay cost them mm -hmm. in the early years of school and when they're finally ready to get to where they're ready they've missed some courses in grade nine mm -hmm. the core subject so when we go to university, they said, okay, you don't know what you want to be in grade eight, nine, but what I want you to do, these are the courses, the good core courses that's going to help you get to university when you're ready. And so it changes the, the, um, the direction of which kids are going to go because they're now informed. Yeah. And so I just try to do a lot, you know, community is part of sports. I think that's pretty awesome because a lot of times, especially I know the the, the area that you're um, uh, working in, there is a immigrant population, large immigrant population there as well. And a lot of times, you know, speaking from my personal experience and my wife's personal experience, who grew up in actually the same area that you're in, 
you know, our parents, they, we, they were first generation immigrants here. They didn't know the, which courses would lead to the right um, programs or opportunities at the university level. So, and, and it, when you're looking at grade nine what courses to pick, it's super difficult. So it, it, I think it's awesome that you're sort of thinking ahead for those kids and bridging the gap where they might not have the resources at home to provide that guidance, right? And and the fact that you've been doing this for so many years is an invaluable resource for these kids in, in the community. Well, I think the other part we always have to remember, immigrants trust people in uniform. Yes. So they, they respect the police, they respect yeah. teachers, they respect doctors. And so they think that they're going to look at look after your kids. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I'm, and I'm saying this because I had a practical experience. The issue is, if you don't know better, you're stuck with what people give you. Right. Information is the most important aspect in anything because it allows you to have a different opinion. If you have one, you're stuck. If you have two, you have a choice. Right. Uh, and so what happens, I remember, well, go to school and let the guidance counselor help you. Unfortunately, what, what happen, happened, and I remember going to grade eight and going to grade, my t- teacher said, I think you'll be a good plumber. I was a very good student. When I went to grade nine, 80%, I never knew there were so many black people in Canada until I went to that school because it was a vocational school. Mm-hmm. All the black kids and minority kids are streamlined to mm-hmm. be plumbers, auto mechanics, you know, all the, you know, the, the those kind of jobs. And the kids who are supposed to go to university, all the white kids, they went to run a maid in the other schools. And so you have a black teacher now who became guidance counselors because um, I deal with young people. They're brilliant. Nobody hears them. I'm the luckiest person in the world. I hear their dreams. I hear all the things that they want to do. Sometimes the parents don't hear. And so parents also do not realize what sport gives to the young people. You know, and we're talking earlier, the ability to learn to fail is probably one of the biggest lessons anyone will learn. And I'll have, I had a friend of mine in high school. He was a 95% student until he went to the University of Toronto. He's not the top kid in school. He quit school. Right. Yeah. Because kids, because he's never had, learned, had to fail. Right. Yeah. You know, and so those are the, the qualities that you have to learn to teach. You know, we talk basketball. In the scheme of things, you know, guys return, retire at 35 years old, 35 years old. You have the whole rest of your life to live. So basketball is it's a small piece in the big scheme of your life, but it's such an important piece when you're young. And when you understand that you did your best and nothing is wrong with getting up in the morning like you and I and going to work. But sometimes kids, they have to learn that process. Yeah. But we have to allow them to learn to fail also. Do, do you see youth today facing sort of different problems than you did when you were a youth? Well, the... When I, I coach a five-year-old, they have no muscle development from being outside where my mom said, get out the house. So I used yeah. to play hockey outside for eight hours yeah, because athletic. in every every community had a skating rink, Yeah. right? So you get out and we go play hockey. And mom said, get out the house. You're not sitting down and watch TV. Um, now, because of the climate is different, what I find parents want their kids home to be safe, but yeah. they sit in a computer and just running around and being kids the kids don't have that muscle development. They have crop tongue it because they video games. They have eye, back, neck problems because they're yeah. playing video sports. So when I see young people, they can't touch their toes. And the, and I see this, to, you know, and it's, it happens to a lot of Im, Im, immigrant parents. They want their kids to be the smartest in the world, but the body that houses the most important part of your body is like a plastic bag. It doesn't serve a purpose. So the other shape, they have bad posture. Yeah. They're not aggressive. They can't deal with people or look at people in the eyes when they speak. So all this talent goes to waste. They have a great brain, but there's no social interaction with people. So That's they fail because there's no combination of, of both. That's interesting. Yeah. So I guess that kind of leads me to my next question, which is as a coach and a mentor, what do you think, what do you think is in, um, makes a great coach and a great mentor to help like a student deal with? Well, the capacity to, to listen that's the most important. The, the, to be able to say I made a mistake. Yeah. Um, to be able to know what you're saying. And the other part, especially when you're dealing with young kids, look the part. Oh, yeah. 
you know, you, you, I say to people, your eyes are probably, it's the greatest tool that we have, but it's also the worst one. Because if you ever look at the old pictures, the old pictures, your eyes see things backwards. The brain is the one that puts it right side. You remember the first picture was always backwards. Right. Yeah. So you're easily deceived by what you see because your eyes are too busy. You cannot focus when you have eyes. You see too many things. It's like there's, if you look at a picture that has 10 pictures in there, everybody can't see the 10 pictures. Yeah. Because, well, you know what happens when you can't see? You hear better. You smell better. You taste better. You use more senses when you can't see. But as soon as you can see, you lose all of the senses. You don't care about them. So if you can't see, you smell the food, but you, you taste with your eyes when you can see, right? So my job as a coach, I don't care about a great athlete. That's God-given, and I could help them. But I want to teach a kid who's not athletic to still be able to compete. So you have to teach them. If someone is faster than me, I'm not going to play them right up. I'm going to take one step back. Right. That allows me to... For him to beat me, he has to take two steps. To the right or left, I have to take one. Right. So, so I teach them fundamentals, how to use a pick on a screen. My college coach told me once, he said, why do you do all the things that you do? Why do you set a pick? Why do you set a screen? Why do I run all the plays? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, to create space between the offense and defense. Change basketball for the rest of my life. Wow. That was a college coach? Coach. Alex Barbier. Yeah. Val Pozan and Albert De Silva. And they used to run the George Brown um, College. And anybody in Toronto or in Canada, they'll tell you um, best basketball minds in the country. Oh, wow. And I was, I was so privileged to be able to play there. But I played in a summer league that had Estonia with all the Olympic, all Olympians from Canada. Um, we, we got the guys from, who played in the Dallas Mavericks. We had the best basketball players in the country played in a summer league which was beyond Mark and Paul Jones. Now, Mark does ESPN. Yeah. Paul does uh, Raptors TV. Simeon Mars, who coached Jamal McGlure. Um, Leon Viner, who passed away. Um, phenomenal basketball players in this country played at the George Brown Summer League. And so you just sat there and you learned because you watched talent. And so I learned from the best. And all those things that I learned on watching great players and listening allowed me to be able to relate um, I walk in most gyms, I can still shoot the ball with the best kids in the gym because muscle memory, but I have, I have my fundamentals. Yeah. So you mentioned that that one coach had talked to you about making space and how that yeah. kind of resonated with you. Was there other advice you received from coaches that have stuck with you? Well, you I remember to... my coach came once and he came, he did a basketball clinic for me and Alex passed away. He was the um, director of George Brown College Yeah. and he bought a rim. And I've never seen, he said, Ken, the rim, I could fit in the rim. I'm 225 pounds. My shoulder fit in the rim. Yeah, you look at some of the slam dunk with the, the mascot, they could fit in the rim. Two balls fit in the rim. So it changed my perception. Once again, your perception become your reality. The rim looks smaller than it is. It's bigger. Interesting. Yeah. Right? So when it's up there 10 feet high, yeah. you know, people say it's big as the ocean and you can't hit it. It is as big as the ocean. Right, but how you perceive it. So it's not as small. It, it taught me about don't always be use your athleticism to the you know use it as a resource, not as everything. Right. Stop and go. Change direction. Um, instead of wasting energy, waste your energy on defense. Offense is at your pace. Defense is you have to work ten times harder to make the other team make a mistake. But defense, you play at your pace. Yeah. You know, you know, like two guys can't trap you and. I see kids panic when people come. Two guys cannot trap you. How they trap you is they use a sideline, half court, the set, half court line or the sidelines. Mm -hmm. That's where traps work. It's hard to trap you in the middle because as soon as two guys, you can still get up to because you can pivot away. If I pivot away, one guy have to come the other way. I can step back through. So two guys can't trap you. We have to, because kids don't know elbows allow you space. Wide base give you vertical space. So as far as your, your your plant legs are, you have that space. So if I swing my elbow and it goes outside the frame of my legs, that's a foul. But if I make a wide base and I keep my elbow within the perimeters of my 
my plant, my foundation, it's not a fall because I have vertical space to the ceiling. Okay. So I learned all the little fundamental stuff. Um, now I have kind of knowledge that I can teach, I can recognize, and now I can implement some of the things that I've learned just from playing and just being around good basketball minds. I guess um, what we talked about, you know, some of the coaches. What do you what do you think makes a successful student? Uh, well, you know, um, it's never it's not talent. And so sometimes we take talent, we put it. Talent is only a word, but hard work. You know, you know, like Kobe, as great as he was, he was an overachiever. Um, LeBron is just gifted. Um, so is LeBron. So was Michael Jordan. But if you look at guys who played in this league, um, great shooters, um, Reggie Miller, how did he become a basketball player? Um, the other one is Rip Hamilton and Stephen Curry. They're great movers. Yeah. Right? They move. They get you tired. Yeah. Um, you have guys who could post you up. So kids, um, coaches decide what happens to kids. And so, it, you know, you have to find what a, a child is good at and help them build it and give them confidence to be able to um, believe in themselves when the eyes, they walk in the gym and you see a 6'10 guy and you think you lost. And so the eye test is the other part. The eye test makes a lot of people fail. And I had, um, I used to coach, I had my girls team, Tamara Tatum, Alicia Tatum. We had one of the best teams in the province. And we walk in the gym and you could see the face of the kids just drop when our girls walk in. Mm. We got girls over six feet. But the game still has to be played. And so when the game starts, all of a sudden the kids become comfortable because they're doing what they're supposed to. They're setting the picks and screens. Their eyes change. The shoulders come up because now all of a sudden they realize they can compete. Yeah. Success and being able to say I did my best, that's what becomes a good athlete or a good basketball or any sport. When you start to see um, gradually you're learning and you're starting to understand. Sometimes as a basketball coach or any coach, you're talking to somebody, there's a blank stare and you know they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you're talking to people and they're not there. Yeah. Um, you, you look in the eyes of your students, you can tell who's paying attention, who can't pay attention, um, who's talking to somebody else. Mm -hmm. The kid who stays late, mm -hmm. the kids who... Um, you know, I tell young students all the time, coach, I didn't make the team. Well, the first thing I say, okay, you didn't make the team. Did you ask the coach why? No. Did you ask him, what did I need to do to get better? No. How do you get better when you don't have an answer? Right. So yeah. I make sure I tell my student that, you know, when I have the kids, when you go to school, coach, I didn't make the team. Okay. First thing I want you to do, go back to the coach and say, coach, thank you for the chance to try out the team. What do you think I need to do? that next time I come out, I'm gonna make the team. It gives you something to work on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the ability to communicate, the ability to not be afraid of someone telling you no, and being able to go back and work and get better. Right. Right. That's what makes a, you know, the guy who could jump out of the gym. I sat for five years with basketball Ontario and high, healthy childhood development. And there's a saying, if you take kids who can't skateboard, give them a skateboard and leave them in a skate park for three hours, when they come back, they can skateboard. Right. Because we learn quickly, we mimic. Yeah. Right? And so if you learn it, you know, I tell kids all the time, you know, you have to learn this. There's certain things how you have to shoot the basketball. If you're seven feet tall, you could get away with this. Right. If you're six, five, ten, you can't get away with that because the ball is here. You have to get the ball above your head and then. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things that you have to teach um, kids and for them to understand. Um, I had a class last week. And I have a five-year-old and I have a 19-year-old. The 19-year-old dunks the ball. That's the best way to score the basket. But it doesn't mean the five-year-old cannot get a basket. Right. But we have to teach the five-year-old now. As he gets older, he has to learn the dribble that allows him to move from point A to point B or to pass. That means because the ball starts moving. Now, if you can't beat that guy, we have to set picks and screens. For you, if the guy goes underneath, you step back, you have a jumper. Right? The biggest play in the NBA, in most basketball, is a pick and roll. roll. Right? You get a big and a little, you get a mismatch where a person could beat one person, you put them in an isolation. You now you have a chance to get success. But it doesn't happen by accident. Once again, it has to be taught. 
and people have to understand how to use it properly. And once you're able to do that, it doesn't matter what athletic ability you have. It doesn't give you, it gives you a chance to compete. Right? That's all you want. And so sometimes you, you're going to lose because they're just better than you. Yeah. But it allows you to compete. Yeah. And that's all you could ever, ever ask for in any sport. Right. So, so you mentioned five-year-old, 19-year-old. Um, what are the age ranges for players that come into your program? Do you have any uh, specific age groups that you focus on? Well, little kids now, because um, one of the things I've, I had 19 teams. I had all the kids. Everybody think they're going to the NBA. <laughs> but I'm tired of traveling. Yeah. And I, I realized the young kids, they want to learn. Right. And so you have to find some way to start. The, um, there's no really high school basketball. It's all AAU. Right. And if you see what's happening now, um, by the time a kid is 25 years old, you have a you have a 30 year old body. Mm-hmm. So kids play basketball all year round. I used to play hockey. We used to go swimming. We used to ride our bikes. We used to go um, in, in the lake and fishing, and just hanging out with your friends. So you had downtime when you play hockey and you play basketball was seasonal. Now, um, the wear and tear in these young athletes, um, they don't last, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't recover properly because um, the more sports you play, the better muscle develop you get because you train different muscles. Mm-hmm. So kids overtrain one set of muscles. Right. And so that's one of the biggest problems that happen now. So I coach little ones. They, I teach them. They want to listen. They have fun. They have a love for the game, but they're fundamentally sound. Right. And as soon as they grow up and they say, coach, I'm ready. I will find a team for you to go to play. But I'm not, those days are done for me. I've, I've so done it not, already. You're not actively coaching at games anymore. No, um, no, I'm, I'm right. done. So yeah. I, I guess with that, you know, um, so your program is more designed around skills development, fundamentals, yes. yeah. uh, ensuring that they're thinking about the game the right way, right? Yeah. So with that, you know, how do you prepare your students um, for the competitions uh, that they are going to face? Is it obviously the fundamentals and that development is important, but then when it comes to in-game, is that just um, letting them get the exposure and then having a feedback cycle with them? Or is it... Um, well, you you watch how kids. So if I see a kid is in my program and he starts next out, yeah, um, we send him off. Okay, he goes someplace else. If they want to play and they want games and stuff, it's not me. Hmm. But I have kids come back from other pros. Coach, you know, I need ball handling skills. All right, I have kids who come back from university. They need a place. Okay, coach, my, you know, my elbow is what? What's wrong with my elbow? Well, if my hand is here, my elbow, is, my finger point. This is, tells you where the ball is going to go. Hmm. So if my elbows are here, here, I sh- if someone shoots the ball and spinning this way, I know where it came out. It came out from the this side of the ball, right? If the ball spinning backwards, I know it came because it rolled off this way, right? So I can tell just by how the ball rotation is. I, I know from which part of the hand the ball is. So um, I'll say, make sure your elbows, you know, against your side. Uh, make sure you follow through. The old saying is taking the cookies out of the top of the fridge right you know that was the release right so those things kids come back and if they need help and they're playing in a rep team rep team don't have time for practice they have time or training you know dry land training is in the summer you look at pro athletes they train they dry land train they get in shape in the summer the seasons for playing right so the gyms are expensive here and mm-hmm. they only have time to run plays for their basketball team mm-hmm the kids who are ready and have skills usually develop faster. But it doesn't mean a Michael Jordan who doesn't make the team. And I always say the kids who learn slower sometimes end up being a better athlete if right. given the opportunity. Yeah. And I say this because um, we all heard of the GOAT, and not Michael Jordan, but man got from Rucker Park. When Kareem Hussein, Michael Jordan, all those guys, he's the best basketball player I've ever seen. I will say to you, Sometimes the best basketball players, we never see them because sometimes they can't go through the system. Mm-hmm. The ones who make it are the ones who are on time, who could get through school, who could listen to a coach, who is not distracted. Those are the ones who make it. doesn't mean they're the best ones. Right. And so that's the other part. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why sometimes people doesn't make it. John Morant, as good as he is, 
He's making horrible choices. And so that lifespan that he has, the rope that he has is now very short. You can't carry a gun in a plane mm -hmm. or in a nightclub and Nike's going to give you $200 million. That goes very quickly because other parents who, this consumer is going to say, we don't want this person. And so that's the other part uh, as a coach that sometimes we t we're looking too much for the athlete making the payday instead of making a better human being. Yeah, right? so a lot of your focus is making sure that, yeah, you have the fundamentals, but also sort of the mental and the emotional growth to be able to use those fundamentals and skills to be a successful athlete. Because you know what? Um, like Shaq is seven feet tall. So I always say that about tall. It's a gift. You didn't do nothing to earn it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? That's a gift from mom and dad. Yeah. I'm 5'10". My son is about 6'2". Right? So I give him a better gift in height than my dad <laughs> gave me. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes yeah. a basketball player, they have gift. They're not normal. Yeah. Right? You and I are normal. And so what happens with the gift that they have, if you teach them how to use it properly, they're going to get a, bene a bigger benefit from the gift that they have. Right. Now, Tyrone Bogues, great mental aptitude. Yeah. Look at Steve Nash. And the shorter players, Tiny Archibald, they're smart. So they're able to navigate, the, you know, um, if you look at Van Fleet, uh, who plays for the Raptors, yeah. you could tell how intelligent he is. Yeah. You watch him how he moves, right? He makes great decisions. The guy who's bigger, sometimes he doesn't understand the importance of what he is. And so he takes it for granted. They, they got away with their natural abilities for so yes. long that they hadn't, to, they didn't have to fight the adversity to, you know, develop other skill sets, right? Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And all you, you look at sports in general, um, sports that minorities play in general, don't always get the same mental help. Right. Because you know why? Because they're, they're almost, um, they're prepackaged. You just take them out and put them in a the microwave and they're ready. Right. The other guys, you have to cook them. You have to teach them. You know, you have to season them. And so what happens a lot of times, um, kids who are great athletes sometimes, they're the ones who are groomed for failure because they haven't learned the process right. of learning all the things necessary to succeed. They succeed just because they're better. Yeah. But they fail when they get where everybody's just as good as them because they haven't, yeah. they haven't been seasoned properly. I mean, I think it's the same parallel as you mentioned about uh, the student that you had um, who quit university, even though he had 95% all throughout uh, grade school and high yeah. school. It's because it was easy up till that point. And then when it became hard, they didn't know how to deal with hard anymore. Yeah. Right. And yeah. uh, you, you, you mentioned the example of Fred Van Leet. He, yeah. went, he went undrafted. Right. And uh, he had to fight through that adversity to get to where he is now on a, you know, uh, amazing contract with the Raptors, but it's that that mental toughness, if you will, that he had to develop or and and figure out a game that was right for him um, that would work at the NBA level, uh, which probably sets him apart from maybe a guy who was six foot two as a point guard but didn't have the same uh, you know uh, yeah. challenges growing up. Yeah. So yeah, but that's why failure is so important. Yeah. Um, you know, we walk around and you look at people in the street and they're poor, they're homeless. They're equipped to live in any environment. Right. Anything happens, you know, they know what to do to survive. You know, we're pampered. And so what happens? We don't have enough scars. We don't have, we don't know what it feels like to be hungry. The process of learning things, the way you have to learn to fight and you, you have learned to fail. And, you know, uh, the, the guy who's, a, you know, sell encyclopedias. Uh, those are tough people because the mm. door been slammed more. Um, that has been open to them, but the, that ability to say uh, the next door is going to be open, you know, great shooters, you know, uh, I'm a, you see Kobe Bryant, no matter what anybody ever said about this guy, he understood that I could miss a hundred. I'm going to make the hundred and first. Those are the ones you want in your team. Failure cannot define you right. because everybody fails. What defines you is what happens after you fail. Right. And so sports allow you to fail, um, miss, make mistakes and still succeed. And I say to kids, um, turnovers don't kill you. Points off turnovers kill you. Right. So if you miss or you make a mistake and you hustle back and you bust your butt and you play defense, that turnover doesn't mean nothing. 
Right. The guy who says, oh, man, I made a turnover, stand up and watch a guy get a basket. That's what kills your team. Right. Turnovers doesn't kill your team. <laughs> Points are turnovers. So just try and understand the difference and what to let slide off your shoulder. Um, that's, you know, that's what defines very good athletes and basketball players or sports people in general. Yeah. So, so you mentioned, um, you know, something interesting about, you know, uh, a lot of times um, people aren't taught how to deal with the mental side of things and don't have that, you know, seasoning, as you as you put it. Um, yeah. What do you what sort of tips do you give, especially because now you're not you used to coach in games, but now you're yeah. not doing that. Yeah. What's your approach to let's say you have a kid who's, you know, you think is ready for competition, but maybe anxious or nervous yeah. about getting there and gets the butterflies everybody gets yeah. butterflies we know yeah. that but like what do you tell them or what how do you help them work through that um either you know before or after they've come back from their first experience of you know having gone through that um how do you help them deal with that mental side of things um to control it right um, well, well um life is everybody's not built the same Mm -hmm. What bothers you or me, that's the hard part when you're trying to teach kids mm -hmm. um, because you have to know the person. Um, it's hard when someone comes to you and if failure defines them, sometimes there's nothing you can do to that person. Right. Right. Uh, I coached on Monday and um, you guys have dealt with um, Titus earlier right. um, because I'm, I'm, I'm do doing some coaching with Titus. Mm -hmm. And the kid is about five years old, very competitive. And he... He's crying all the time because he's failing. Mm -hmm. And I say to him, I said, you can't come in this place. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to have fun. Uh, you have to learn. All I want you to do is try. So we have little games after we, we train. And he's traveling. I'm saying, stop. Okay. I said, I don't mind you traveling, but I want to see some dribbling in there, the process. And he's crying. I said, stop. I said, it's okay. I said, don't let... Don't cry about something you want to have fun at. That's not, it doesn't work. And I say this because parents make mistakes with their kids. Mm -hmm. they, they bring kids, they want to take them out of the house and bring them in a sport just to get different activities. Wrong advice. Never put your kid in a program just to have fun. Because what happens when they start to see other kids learning? Because kids pay attention. People don't think they do. When they see they're not getting better, they don't want to compete. Never just put a child in there just to get them out of the house. Put them, in a, put them in a program where you want the kid to learn. To work hard. And get better. Don't put them for your benefit because you don't want him running and bouncing off the walls. <laughs> so this is the part that happens. So you have to know that athlete. Mm. And I say to, uh, you know, I'll shoot a jumper and I said, everybody misses. Everybody turns over. I said, it's part of the process. And I tell that I had a 6'5 kid. We went and played in Buffalo. My best player, and he shot the ball here, and he big jumper. And we went to the, the chiro chiropractic college in Buffalo in a basketball tournament years ago. And I used to say to him, I say, Adrian, you have to put your shot a little higher. I, I say, you're better than everybody here. I said, once you get down there, these guys are six, 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 seven. If your ball is here, they're going to block you. Going back in the bus, and he's balling. And this is a 17-year-old kid. I said, what did I tell you? He said, coach, no, I'm, I'm, I'm well to learn. And so that's sometimes what has to happen. You know, it's when someone thinks they can do better, you can't teach them. Right. Sometimes somebody has to be where they're down to nothing. And now they're looking up and say, no, I'm ready to learn. Mm -hmm. If they're looking even at you, they think they're still compatible. Mm -hmm. If they think they're over you, they're looking down, they're not going to learn. So mm -hmm. same thing with sports. If kids don't look at you and respect you, when I was a kid and when I'm, you know, I'm going to be, I'm 61 years old, we, we were taught to listen. You see this generation, they question everything. Right. Because they are so used to having information at their fingertips. Right. So I walk in a gym, I look the part. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was going to ask you about that as well, which is, um, you know, you've been coaching for, for a while now. What, what's the difference? We've been coaching kids in the early 2000s versus now in terms of kids seeing coming in and even at the age of like seven or eight, they're, they're so heavily influenced by, you know, Instagram basketball yep. and yeah. um, uh, some of the fundamentals they learned there. Yeah. Right. So um, how, how do you, 
how do you get them to buy in to the philosophy that these are the actual fundamentals that you need to work through? Or do you just let them, as you said, come to their own, fail enough times that they'll want to learn on their own accord? Well, it's, it starts off with warm up. I can touch my toes. Yeah. And you wouldn't realize the simple things kids can't do. Right. So I start off with stuff that I can do that they can't do. Right. I warm them up, ball handling skills, I have the ball, close my eyes, I have a good touch with the ball, I spin the ball in my hand. I could shoot the ball, I could go around, I could still, I'm a very good shooter, I could shoot three pointers, I, I could shoot it off the bank. And so when kids say, Coach, I want to shoot like you, right? Ball handling stuff, um, stop and so things in practice because kids are paying attention. So the fact that I can touch my, a lot of kids can't touch their toes. Um, we say they have alligator's arm, alligator arm, because the arm becomes short, <laughs> because they don't do enough movement. Right. Right? So just warming up, um, little ball handling skills, playing the piano, so you roll the ball in a figure eight with your fingertips, right? It's Most kids can't do that. So you warm up, kids are always looking. And so, coach, how do you do that? You'd be surprised. Little kids are very inquisitive. Mm -hmm. Right? Coach, how do you shoot the ball like that? And so, by example, right? Um, the old days, you know, <laughs> I could dunk the basketball. Um, I'm a very good shooter. So even, you know, 20 years ago, um, the kids, because I looked the part, I could play one-on-one -on -one with the kids. Now, kids say, Coach, you ever played basketball? <laughs> <laughs> Coach, where's the video? There's no video. I, when I finished college, the three-pointer was not even in. Right. Right? And so, but I show my kids this, you know, when I catch the ball, you know, um, I see a lot of kids learn to play basketball. When they throw the ball, they teach the kids to catch the ball like this. I also say catch a ball shot ready. You have to learn. When I see the kid, people think they catch the ball with their hands. Yes, your eyes also, you have to catch the ball with your eyes. Your eyes is also a component. Right? So people don't realize that. People say, when you catch... You catch with your hands. Yes, a, a blind man cannot catch a ball because you have to track. So when you explain and see, when you start to talk to kids, they learn very quickly mm. um, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So part of the process, I myself as a coach, and I try to get like-minded coaches um, that understand. I have a, one of my coaches, Vasco, Vasco Yard. If you look in uh, college in Canada, he has the highest free throw average in the history of college basketball in Canada. And so guys who understand the fundamentals, you get people around um, that the kids will look up to, mm. um, right? How do you shoot ball handling skills? Um, I have a young man, Jaden Maxwell. He's been with me since he's about five years old. He's going to Trent University to be a teacher. So he's growing up in my program. I have kids, I coach their parents, right? So I'm doing two generations, <laughs> right? So. I have a lot of loyalty in my basketball program because of how I treat people and how I treat the kids. Say, I want my, they say, coach, I hope you're not retiring because you have to coach my kids. <laughs> I mean, so that's where I am as a, as a basketball coach because I pay attention to detail. Um, I listen to what kids have to say because they always have something to say. And uh, my program, what do I do? Every parent has to stay. You can't go do groceries. You can't go do your hair. As soon as your child accomplishes something, the first person they look for is their parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we try to do is build a relationship where parents are now participants. They yeah. see, instead of, uh, Billy, how was practice? They say, Billy, oh, you had a great practice today. It changes the dynamics of the relationship between parents and kids. Because mm -hmm. I think um, coaches have too much power. Because kids are isolated with coaches too much. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've been in the sport and I see parents can't come in the gym <clears throat> because um, they don't want to distract their kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. But parents have a responsibility to also look after the kids because there's also a lot of bad things happening out there mm -hmm. yeah. with coaches. Allow a parent to sit down and watch the kids and see how the kids is progressing, but see kids' failure. And also, uh, parents learn the game and they can teach their kids. Yeah. Right? You sit and watch. You stay long enough. You stop. Some of the stuff is going to rub off on you, and so I kind of change. You know, I have parents who want to have parents learning basketball. They take, um, put on their gym shorts, and they train with their kids. 
right? So they're working with the ball handling. I have parents who learn basketball through by basketball program. Nice. Yeah. Right? So I try to be, you know, once again, it's not just the sport. I think um, family involvement. Yeah. Um, it's hard enough parents communicating the kids. But if you're always around, it's not something foreign. And right. I was a very, you know, my parents never seen me play one game, but they didn't understand the importance of it. Yeah. Right? It changes when, you know, you know, I'm in Florida or the Peace Games. That's the one bit difference in the United States. Uh, Friday night lights, everybody comes out. Grandparents, great grandparents, the dog, the cat, everybody participates with the kids um, in sports in the United States. I think Canada's a little different. Um, we just drop the kids off. But right. we have to find ways because your time with your kids are very short. Yeah. You know, and so that's some of the reasons. So we um, we have a we ask people a pro tip question because we're sure. a pro tip channel, uh, and since you've been involved with a lot of coaching and mentoring, I'm so curious if you have a, a pro tip for someone who's thinking about becoming a coach or a mentor. Uh, well, I, as I said earlier, we have to learn to listen. Um, you have to look. Um, I, I, I go and do a lot of basketball clinics. You have kids who could hide in a gym with a hundred people playing. They're hiding. Okay. Yeah. You have to be able to pay attention. Yeah. Like people say, Ken, like, how do you know? Because I pay attention. Right? You, you can't afford to miss a kid. I see. Yeah. Right? Um, you have to pay attention. The kid who gets the ball, as soon as they get it, they pass it away and they kind of disappear, staying away from the play. The play. You have to seek them out. I see. How do you make them confident to participate? But coach, you're laughing. You can't laugh at nobody in my gym. A parent can't yell at the kid. I had a parent. You can't yell at your kid in my gym. Yeah. When you come in here, you're here to encourage. It's part of fail. Let them learn to fail. Right. What parent wants and what a kid wants are two different things. Right. Right. So I have parents. Well, he's not doing that. Well, let him learn at his rate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they want to learn at their rate. It doesn't. Not in my gym. I said, leave the kid alone. Yeah. yeah. If you and want to control him, sorry, you can't stay. Yeah, and but what you said. Wanting, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, but as I said, you know, and I have to, I have to tell it because I understand as a parent also, you want what's best for you. Oh, come on, Johnny, let's let's get that. You know, you, a child hears the parent's voice before yeah. the coaches. Right. So I've had to put parents in their place. <laughs> when I'm talking, I don't want you speaking. Right. Right. When you're in the car, when you're outside, when I'm not coaching, that's your job as parent. Yeah. If you come in the gym and you want to participate with your kid, that's different. Now you're participating, but you're also a parent coaching. Mm -hmm. So you get a little more leeway, but you can't yell at the child. Right. It, it, it's so, I can hear in through your philosophy here, the impact of that baseball coach that, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what you've instilled now in your program of how to avoid losing that child from the sport, you know, and, and yeah. ensuring that they have the right environment to, to fail, learn and find their own way. And then if they choose basketball later or not, or go on to do something else, that's their, their choice. But it wasn't because the program wasn't, um, uh, supportive. Uh, yes. So yeah, I think that's uh, pretty awesome. Um, yeah. I think now we're going to jump into the rapid fire, right, Chris? <laughs> uh, All right. Yeah, we're, we're wrapping up here. We really appreciate your time. Uh, we've got a, few rapid fire questions simple stuff no wrong answers uh, all right so do you have a past or present favorite basketball player well my guy was always dr g that's nice. um you know old school the hair yeah. um <laughs> big hands he danced in the air yeah, yeah. And, I, and i think one of the things I, I think the sport has changed more um it's very mechanical so it's not, it's more, um, it's very, um, the, the big guy doesn't play a big guy role and be mm -hmm. dominant inside. And I don't know why, because everybody, want, this three-point thing has changed the game. But what it, it changes the game, a big guy, it's a big guy game. It becomes a high percentage shot when you have a guy like Joel Embiid yeah. or, or Jokic in the basket. He's so big and dominant. Why would you sell for a, a three-pointer? Three. Yeah. Yeah. It looks nice. But all the advantages of being bigger and stronger, they take it away. Huh. Right? So I just see the game a little differently. But Dr. J is my guy. All right. And do you have a favorite sneaker? 
I used to wear the Converse All Star. Yeah. Yeah. But my favorite shoe is the Adidas Pro model. I have about nine pairs. Okay. <laughs> That's my favorite shoe. But I, I remember the Converse, great shoe in my teen years. Yeah. Nice. And when you were when you were playing competing, did you have a like a go-to pregame song? Man, well, back in the you know, we had Rapper's Delight um, oh, nice. in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Um you know, I mean, whatever is playing, you know, yeah. one of the things that happened. I played, um, we call it, there was a black basketball um, community. Yeah. So you come from Nova Scotia, you come from, um, there all these, things have changed so much. Um, so there was all black tournaments. So Detroit, Montreal, Nova Scotia, all the teams from Toronto. Uh, it's the best basketball for me personally, yeah. um, because it was different, it was family. This is now everybody's your club, Guys, you know, uh, Wayne Year would have played, he's in Montreal, Tommy Kane. They come from Montreal, they say, they, they'll take three guys from Toronto, they pick up. And everybody's sitting together and they're friends, you go to these guys first after. This thing is like, you don't shake hands after mm -hmm. the game. There's no socialization. And I think that's what I missed and my kids missed. Exactly. And this generation where sport tied people together, it had mm -hmm. great relationship. Um, the sport brought us together and we're friends. You're not friends now after the game. You don't socialize. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, the era with which I played, I'm friends with all the guys I competed with against. Yeah. And that, those are my friends now. And I think the kids don't have that. They're only their team. And they don't spread past it. Cause I used to go to, I live in Scarborough. I go to Mississauga, Ron Hepburn and Ron Hex, all those guys. And out in Westway, and and then we go downtown and play with Donnie Williams and those guys, and then we come back to Scarborough and play. So we could go anywhere and play. You can't do that now. And so mm -hmm. basketball has boundaries. You mm -hmm. can't go and play in this neighborhood because you're not welcome. And I think we've lost uh, that relationship that we had through sport because it's be it become just teams. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> on the team note, <laughs> do you have yeah. a bigger jersey? I'm a Raptors guy. Yeah. Right? But growing up, George Stone Hollers. Okay. And Everybody as, wore George Stone. And then as, as a coach or even a player, do you have a favorite basketball drill? Um, every, anything to do with shooting because I think yeah. um, if you can shoot the basketball, no one can cover you. Yeah. And it, then on um, the other side, do you have a least favorite drill? Uh, running the lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I ran, I ran. I like, I, I, I train in the summer. We have a ski hill. Yeah. And I remember uh, we played George Brown and we done a Spadina, and you had to carry somebody your own weight up the hill and oh, back geez. down. So I had, I had 28 inch legs. I could jump, and so we were so strong and athletic, and they made us great physical people. Yeah. Right. So I look at these kids. I'm so happy that my days of running are, is done, but. Those things are necessary because legs are the foundation of the game. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Coach, thank you so much for your time. This was fantastic. Yeah. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Um, I think we got some great insights and got to hear your story of how, how, how you got into this, uh, pro how you built this program. Um, so again, once again, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. You know, once again, you know, I, I consider you guys friends, you know, call me anytime. Uh, relationship that's what life is about when Absolutely. you can sit down and talk to people and uh, you know what you guys do I think it's important um, because what it does it brings different people into other people's computer or living room yeah. and it just shows you a different part of what a lot of coaches do or who they are and it just makes it more you know what people see so thank you awesome. I really enjoy this too thank, thank you, you. Uh, if, if you enjoyed today's episode you know don't forget to like and subscribe and follow pro tip um, all the links are in the description and as I said, we'll put Coach's bio in the uh, show notes as well. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, fellas.